Good afternoon. Thank you all for joining me. I know there's a lot of other very good talks, so people are going to come in and out. Hopefully that won't uh, bother anyone. Um, <clears throat> I'm coming back again this year to discuss different aspects of a topic that's near and dear to my heart. I've been doing a lot of research and speaking on the topic of HPA axis dysfunction uh, and abnormal cortisol patterns for several years now. And one of my hopes, since obviously the, the whole idea of HPA axis dysfunction and stress, abnormal cortisol levels is, is prevalent and, and pervasive and universal in all of our patients. So with the increased effect that that plays on health, the effects of HPA axis dysfunction on a patient's clinical presentation, I feel it's very, very important to continue to teach everyone that there are so many other factors that can influence someone's cortisol pattern and whether or not their adrenal glands are making cortisol and, um, and why, again, making the case for the fact that adrenal fatigue should not be the all-encompassing term uh, for why you see a patient with low cortisol. So today what I'm going to talk about is yet another influence on someone's uh, cortisol release patterns. And uh, we're going to talk specifically about saliva, and I'll explain to you why we're going to do that in just a moment. All of the information I'm presenting to you here today is evidence-based medicine, and my references are available in the uh, written material that you received. There's also an article that's been written in your anti-aging uh, magazine, I believe it's on page 58, that uh, speaks to other uh, aspects of uh, adrenal fatigue, so to speak. So I would like to start by, first of all, <clears throat> giving you a brief description of what we're going to talk about. I'd like to review just basic aspects and components of the hypothalamic pituitary axis. I'd like to discuss uh, the clinical utility of salivary cortisol testing and why I'm discussing that in particular today when I'm talking about the effects of pharmaceutical agents because unless your practice is different from mine, nearly every patient I see takes at least one, if not more, uh, as an internist, usually five to ten different prescription medications. And unless you have a patient who takes no drugs and no over-the-counter uh, medications, uh, this is an extremely important topic for you to understand because it influences what the HPA axis does and what you're going to make it as far as an interpretation goes on what their cortisol pattern looks like once you see it. <clears throat> Now, just to quickly review the hypothalamic pituitary axis, uh, for those of you who already know this, please forgive me, but, but obviously everything originates in the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland in the central nervous system. So whether and to what extent you identify a stressor as uh, something that is stressful to you and then causes a fight or flight response has a lot to do with what's going on in your brain. Obviously, your brain has to sense that an environment is stressful. That goes to the limbic system that then tells your brain, well, this is stressful to me. It's all about perception and then what your body does with the perception of the stressor. And once the hypothalamus kicks in uh, and produces CRH, which is the hormone that tells the pituitary gland to make ACTH, then ACTH goes to the adrenal glands and tells the adrenals to make multiple different hormones, but primarily cortisol, aldosterone, DHEA, pregnenolone, and others. And that pathway is extremely important because, again, when we're making the argument that adrenal fatigue is not the true form of why low cortisol states evolve, it's easy to see how many different places, and this is just at the level of the hypothalamus, pituitary, and the adrenal, how many different places the system can be affected so that ultimately you won't get cortisol produced at the other end. Okay. Now, this system is influenced by neurotransmitters, amino acids, other hormones, cytokines in the immune system, uh, ACE levels, angiotensin II levels. Very, very uh, important that you understand the complexity because in all of those different places, there can be things that block that pathway, and the end result is low cortisol. Okay? So we're going to look at here, <clears throat> there's the, the CRH AVP that's produced in the hypothalamus that then tells the pituitary gland to make ACTH, which then tells the adrenals to, to make cortisol. And this is a very uh, <clears throat> generalized overview. And then all the things at the cellular level. And I'm showing you this because, again, pharmaceutical agents can affect cortisol translocation into the nucleus of a cell, transcription, translation, to make the protein cortisol at the end. So there's all of these different places where cortisol production can be disrupted. And today we're going to talk specifically about how specific pharmaceutical agents can impact this and where they act. Now, the reason why I'm discussing salivary cortisol is because a lot of the research that's coming out on HPA axis dysfunction 
and cortisol in general, they're utilizing salivary testing as a means to gather the information. Certainly there's serum testing, although studies show that that's uh, fairly unreliable. There's urinary testing that can be done, analyses of hair, uh, nails. So there's different types of um, biological samples that one can obtain. But salivary uh, cortisol actually offers clinical benefit and diagnostic utility for several different reasons. First of all, it's, it's a true bioavailable fraction of cortisol, which is truly the, the free, the active form of cortisol that is available to, to pr produce the outcome, produce the uh, hormone effect. And <clears throat> studies have shown it to, to be very closely correlated with serum cortisol levels. Now, obviously, serum cortisol levels are affected by cortisol binding globulin. And so as the level of that protein rises, the level of free cortisol falls. And cortisol's uh, the cortisol, cortisol binding globulin complex cannot get into the salivary gland. So only cortisol can get into the salivary gland. But there is a little misconception that saliva is not affected by cortisol binding globulin. Indirectly it is. Because in order for cortisol to get into the saliva, it cannot be stuck to cortisol binding globulin. So there's still an impact of, of a patient's uh, CBG levels on their overall cortisol. In, this, in the saliva. It's easy to collect, and it, al it actually also allows the patient to collect the sample under their own environmental situation. So the patient can live their day, go to their job, pick up their children, do whatever else they need to do, and collect the saliva because you really want to get a sample of what's representative for what they're doing throughout their day.